So, Erev Tov. Shalom lekulam. Good evening, and thank you all for joining us for this webinar. Uh, I am Yotam Galit at Tel Aviv University's uh, School of Political Science, Government, and International Affairs. And this event has been uh, organized together with Noam Gidron, Professor of the Department of Political Science at the Hebrew University. And the event tonight is co-sponsored by our respective departments at Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. We have uh, two distinguished speakers today, Professors Adam Shavorsky and Daniel Ziblatt, both of whom have written some of the most prominent work on our topic today, namely the crisis of democracy and the threat of erosion that many liberal democracies are currently facing. The fact that both our speakers agreed to participate in this event on such short notice is, of course, um, a cause of delight, but it's probably also a sign of just how alarming and urgent the current situation that Israel is confronting. We're clearly at a historic crossroads for our country. We have quite a few non-Israeli participants joining us on this webinar from overseas, and so briefly I'll lay out some basic facts to help contextualize the discussion today. After five, after five tightly fought elections in less than three years, the elections this past November provided Netanyahu's right-wing bloc with a majority of 64 seats from a Knesset of 120. His government's first move was to embark on a major ju judicial overhaul that includes several components, and chief among them is that it prevents, in all but very rare cases, the Supreme Court from being able to strike down laws that have passed through Parliament. It also allows a simple majority of 61 members of parliament to ignore a court decision and provides the government an inherent majority in the committee that appoints judges at all levels in Israel. Proponents of this reform claim that it is a much needed rebalancing of power against the court that has become too activist. Critics say that this is not a reform, but rather a judicial coup that will give the government absolute power over the judiciary, wipe out the only meaningful check on the executive power, and indelibly harm Israel's democracy. One of the things that every student of democratic theory learns, particularly from the writings of Adam Shaborsky, who will talk to us in a few moments, is that the fundamental aspect of democracy is that it's a system that allows societies to settle disagreements and conflicts in a peaceful manner. This, of course, is done via elections. One side wins, the other side loses, and both sides accept the idea that the winner will get to advance its preferred policies. The winner does well in government, it will probably get re-elected. If not, the public will replace it. And so the cycle goes. But the second component of democracy is the understanding of both sides that the winner gets to advance its desired policies only under a set of well-defined rules and constraints. The first is the obligation to ensure basic and equal rights to all citizens, a key component of a liberal democracy. The second constraint is that once you get elected, you cannot unilaterally change the rules of the game in ways that curtail the checks on your power and entrench your position in office. Because if that is what the winner does, and this is key, then the stakes grow exponentially higher as both sides suddenly have almost everything to lose. The opposition fears the future of a changed country that is less democratic and in which it is going to be that much harder to regain power via elections. And the winners can't afford to lose office because they vested so much power in the hands of government that then handing all this unchecked power over to their opponents is simply not, a, not an option. And in such a situation, the country then is set on a path toward the breakdown of democracy and potentially also toward a terrible clash between the two opposing sides. Alarmingly, this theoretical scenario is in many ways what is the threat that Israel is currently confronting. Now, some of the recent developments we're witnessing here may seem unique and highly specific to the Israeli context, but when what, zooming out, it's clear that certain patterns mirror developments that took place in other countries as well. Better understanding what these patterns are can help us all get a clearer sense of the upheaval that is currently gripping Israel, and hopefully also gain some insight about the ways to confront and counteract it. For this reason, we thought it would be informative and helpful to hear from our two speakers today. Each will talk for about 20 minutes. If participants at home have questions, please feel free to uh, use the chat option to write to us, and we'll try to include some of the questions in the Q&A session that will follow. Our first speaker uh, is going to be Daniel Ziblatt, the Eton Professor of Government at Harvard University and Director of the Transformations of Democracy Research Unit at the WZB in Berlin. He specializes in the study of Europe and the history of democracy and has published widely on these topics. And most relevant to our discussion today, in 2018, he published a co-authored book with Steve Levitsky titled How Democracies Die, 
The book was a New York Times bestseller, has already garnered over 4,000 citations in different languages, and even was mentioned by President Barack Obama as one of his recommendations, recommended books of the year. We're very glad to have you here speak to us, Daniel. Floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Really honored to be with all of you today in which I know is a, a very difficult moment in Israeli political life. And I should just say that I'm, you know, uh, by not by any stretch of the imagination, expert on Israeli politics. I've spent my career, as you just heard, studying European and American politics and history. So I'm going to really lean in heavily on the international perspectives title of the panel. And I hope the perspective has some payoff for you all. Now, most 21st century democracies die via constitutional hardball. That is, democracy is weakened as the letter of the law is deployed to undermine the spirit of the law. Democratic backsliding occurs gradually sometimes, sometimes quickly, but through a series of reasonable looking and legal measures, new laws are issued, ostensibly designed to clean up elections, combat corruption, or create more efficient or accountable judiciaries. Because the measures are couched in legality, it may appear as if little has changed. No blood is shed, no one is arrested or sent into exile, parliament remains open. So criticism of the government's measures is often dismissed as just mere alarmism or partisan whining. But the record around the world is pretty clear. Sometimes almost imperceptibly, the competitive playing field of democracy tilts, sometimes gradually. The democratic game becomes more and more unfair. The cumulative effect of these seemingly innocuous legal measures is to make it harder for the opponents of a government to compete. Incumbents are entrenched in power and democracy is fundamentally weak. Now the defenders of these sorts of measures make a very familiar kind of argument that will likely ring very loudly in your ears today. We are the Democrats, you might hear. We are the elected government. Counter-majoritarian institutions like courts and other similar institutions are the real threat to democracy, and they must be dismantled to prevent powerful minority interests from imposing their undemocratic will on the real majority. So what is the proper way to think about this kind of argument? How should one respond when illiberal governments claim to be speaking, to simply be implementing majority will? I think it's important to think about this because really it's actually a quite powerful argument. After all, isn't the essence of democracy majority rule? We must remember that James Madison himself, one of the primary authors of America's Checks and Balances said the essence of the Republican principle is majority will. So I wanna give you my answer to this question. And it's what I wanna make clear is this is not an answer that tells you what to do in response to leaders who make these kinds of arguments. It's rather to tell you how and why you must win these arguments. So here's uh, step number one of my answer. As you just heard, modern democracy is not simply a, a system of majority rule. It combines majority rule and minority rights. Early defenders of limited government feared excessive or count concentrations of power, not only in the hands of kings, but also in the hands of popular majorities. And so the form of government that emerged between the late 18th and 20th centuries, which today we call liberal democracy, is based on two pillars, collective self-rule on the one hand, majority rule, and liberties or minority rights on the other. Although liberal democracy cannot exist without free and fair elections where majorities are allowed to speak, not everything in a democracy can or should be up for grabs in elections. In the words of the former US Supreme Court Justice in the United States, Robert Jackson, some domains of political life should be placed in his words, beyond the reach of majorities. Where should the line be drawn? I'll come back to this in a moment uh, at the end, but. This, these institutions are what political scientists call counter-majoritarian institutions. Now, the reality is that most democracies mix counter-majoritarian institutions, things like unelected judges and bills of rights on the one hand, with majoritarian institutions like elections on the other. In the global distribution of democracies, the United States, where I'm sitting right now, is at one end of the spectrum. The United States is arguably the most counter-majoritarian democracy in the world. Majorities hardly govern at all. The U.S. is the only democracy in the world that still elects our president via the Electoral College, which means the popular vote winner very often doesn't win power, as happened in 2000, 2000 2016, totally counter-majoritarian. America has a second chamber of Senate that vastly represents low population areas, the most malapportioned second chamber in the world after Argentina and Brazil, totally counter-majoritarian. 
The U.S. is the only democracy in the world, as far as I know, where a legislative minority can permanently veto a legislative majority. This is the Senate practice of the filibuster, totally counter-majoritarian. The U.S. is the only democracy in the world with the Supreme Court that has neither term limits nor a retirement age, which give rise, gives rise to a uniquely intergenerational counter-majoritarianism, sometimes called the problem of the dead hand, in which minorities from a previous generation, often no longer living, govern the living of today. And then finally, the United States has the hardest constitution in the world to change. Only 27 amendments in the U.S.'s 250-year history, whereas a country like Norway with, has a constitution nearly as old as America's, has been amended hundreds of times, with very high Freedom House scores today as well. Again, the U.S. is totally counter-majoritarian. So the U.S. is a, a counter-majoritarian outlier at one end of an extreme. So the, the reason I bring all of this up is how one thinks about calls for more majority rule depends entirely on context. Given America's extreme counter-majoritarian system, calls for a bit more majority rule in the United States are justifiable, say the direct election of presidents, term limits on federal judges, eliminating the filibuster. Now Israel is in many ways at the opposite end, polar opposite end of the United States. It sets at the other end of the global distribution of democracies, unicameral parliament, unitary state, no written constitution, Counter-majoritarian checks are essentially absent, save for the court system. So Israel's at the other end of the ex extreme. So calls in this setting for more majority rule, fewer constraints on an elected government, strike me as deeply implausible, if not dangerous. So that's, that's point number one. Point number two, ask, I wanna ask a more fundamental question. How much majoritarianism is too much? Or more to the point, where should we draw the line? Now, this is a difficult question, but I think in a democracy, two domains must be protected from majorities. The line must be drawn around these two domains. The first is the protection, as we just heard in the introduction, of individual liberties. This includes core civil liberties that are necessary for any democracy. Freedom of speech, press, association, assembly. It includes also a range of other domains in which our individual life choices should be free from the interference of elected governments or legislative majorities. Uh, elected governments shouldn't be able to have the power to regulate our religious practice. They shouldn't decide what books we can read, what movies we can watch, what we can, can be taught in universities. They shouldn't decide the gender of the person we marry or interfere with bodily autonomy. Now, although the scope of rights to protect will always be some matter of dispute, there clearly exists a range of individual liberties that, again, in the words of Justice Jackson, may not be submitted to a vote. They depend on the outcome of no election. In the U.S., the U.S. Bill of Rights enshrines individual liberties, in effect, roping off uh, them from the whims of temporary majorities. So individual liberties must be protected from majorities. But majorities also must be constrained in a second area. This is another area where a line has to be drawn. And this is especially important, I think, today in Israel. The rules of democracy itself. Elected governments must not be able to use their temporary majorities to entrench themselves in power by changing the rules of the game in ways that weaken their opponents or undermine fair competition. This is the specter of majority tyranny. The possibility that a government will use its popular or parliamentary majority to vote the opposition and democracy out of existence. I'm just gonna briefly describe an extreme case, but I think a revealing case, the country of Tanzania that freed itself from European colonial rule in the early 60s, ushered in in a period of great optimism and hope, the independence movement was led by the African National Union. Uh, its leader was a revered leader, had widespread support in the first election. They won 70 of 71 seats. But over time, that party used that majority to wipe out the opposition. Parliament first passed the 1962 Preventive Detention Act, which allowed the government to jail its opponents, then rewrote the constitution to outlaw the opposition completely, establish single party rule, and the party is still in power today. So here's the point. The opposition's right to compete on a level playing field is another essential minority right that must be beyond the reach of majorities. Democracies must create mechanisms that protect the democratic process from majorities that would subvert it. The process of constitutional amendment would therefore should be difficult so that the rules of the game cannot simply be changed to recast to the advantage of present day incumbents. One way of doing this, is through rules that prevent simple majorities from amending the constitution. Most democracies require supermajorities, or at least two thirds of the legislature to amend or rewrite the constitution. 
um, and other democracies intentionally uh, inject a lay to this counter-majoritarianism, requiring the approval of two successive elected parliaments. Independent judiciaries with constitutional review, meaning they have the authority to strike down unconstitutional laws, are another counter-majoritarian check on majority tyranny. Now, even with these kinds of controls around, the threat of majority tyranny always remains present. So what I want to do is talk about the kind of prime example of this in recent years, which is the case of Hungary under Viktor Orban, which over the past 13 years has used its parliamentary majority to impose constitutional electoral reforms that totally eviscerated judicial checks on Orban's power and disadvantaged the opposition. It has led ultimately to the de-democratization of Hungary. In Hungary it was too easy for majorities to change the rules. So um, the result of this, as I said, is the kind of parliamentary supermajority, which has built an unfair advantage against the opposition. So how did Orban do this? Well, he did this really in three steps, I would say, common to a set of strategies that many would be authoritarians use. Because it sometimes happens so fast or so in, in such complicated, convoluted way, it's sometimes hard to see. And so I want to use a very simple analogy to allow uh, people to see this when it happens. And the analogy is to draw on from a soccer game. In a soccer game, the first thing you want to do is capture the referees. It's always good to have the referees on your side. So in, a, in politics, what are the referees? The referees are the neutral arbiters of the state, courts, prosecutors, judicial institutions. Now, the thing about these kinds of institutions is they both represent a challenge and an opportunity to would-be autocrats. If they remain in independent, if these kinds of institutions remain independent, they might expose and punish government abuse. But they're also an opportunity because if these kinds of agencies and institutions can be controlled by loyalists, they can serve the incumbent. So the first thing autocrats try to do, elected autocrats try to do, is try to capture the referees. The second thing they try to do, again, keeping with the soccer metaphor, is they try to sideline some of the other side star players. Uh, this may be, uh, or what they perceive as the other side star players. This may be business, or it may be uh, um, opposition groups, it may even be media. And then finally, what a uh, would-be autocrat does, again, keeping with the metaphors, tr to try to tilt the playing field. They try to rewrite the rules of the game to lock in these temporary advantages, in effect, tilting the playing field against the opponents. Now, thinking about Hungary for a moment, Orban, the first thing he tried to do was to try to capture the referees. One of the first things he did was to purge and pack the courts. Prior to 2010, justices of the court were selected by a parliamentary committee composed of representatives of all the political parties. This probably sounds familiar. A new rule uh, replaced this multi-party mechanism with procedures allowing Orban's party to use its supermajority to unilaterally appoint justices. Another constitutional amendment was passed, expanding the court from 11 to 15, which created four vacancies for his party to fill. And then Orban removed the independent-minded uh, Supreme Court uh, president, Andres Baca, via law requiring Supreme Court presidents to have at least five years of judicial experience in Hungary. This is a clear instance of lawfare. The new law clearly targeted the, the Baca, a prestigious judge who had worked for 17 years outside of Hungary. And so he was forced to step down. But that still wasn't enough because then parliament also passed a law lowering the retirement age for judges from 70 to 62 and forcing all judges over the age of 62 to retire immediately. Then a, to a total of 274 judges were forced out, although the, and the law was later appealed under pressure from the European Union, but many of these retired judges never came back. So that's the first thing that Orban did. But he also went after the media um, and used legal measures to kind of force a restructuring, a kind of restructuring of the media, of the public media structures, firing lots of journalists, and then much more subtly going after uh, private media as well. And then finally, uh, the thing that uh, Orban did was to tilt the playing field. He takes the playing field by packing the Electoral Commission, which prior to 2010 was appointed via multi-party consensus. Five of the 10 seats were filled by delegates of each of the five major parties, other parties, while the other five were filled by mutual agreement between the government and the opposition. So this assured that no single party dominated this process. Well, Orban abandoned this practice and filled all five non-delegate seats with loyalists, thereby giving itself a party, a controlling majority on the Electoral Commission. This electoral commission then egregiously gerrymandered parliamentary districts to overrepresent the incumbent strongholds and underrepresent the opposition. This gave, in the words of one critic at the time, the party a good 30-yard advantage in a 100-yard sprint. 
And all of these efforts play, paid off. 2014, party lost, however, the party lost 600,000 votes relative to its vote share in 2010. Uh, but it was felt, vote share from, fell from 53 to 45 percent, and yet it captured the same number of seats as in 2010, retaining its supermajority domination of the parliament. Repeated the trick in 2018, as well as in 2022, and it appears from lots of people's perspectives that Orban cannot be defeated under normal conditions. Okay, so Israel really, of course, has no constitution, and so it makes it easy to change the rules. And this is the same thing that allowed Orban to do things. Without, with only requiring a two thirds requirement in the parliament made it very easy to change the constitution. So um, what I wanna do then though, is talk about an important caveat. And this will be my final point here, that even as uh, we note that certain things must be roped off from majorities, we must also recognize that democracies also must empower majorities. Counter majoritarianism can in fact, in principle be a problem. A political system that doesn't grant majorities considerable power cannot be called a democracy. This is certainly true. This is the danger of counter-majoritarianism. Rules designed to fetter majorities may allow partisan minorities to consistently thwart and rule over majorities. This is uh, what Robert, what Robert Dahl, the eminent theorist, once said that fear of tyranny majority sometimes obscures the equally dangerous phenomenon of tyranny in the minority. So it's certainly true that certain things must be beyond, just as it's certainly true that certain things must be beyond the reach of majority, some certain things must be within the reach of majorities. And there's two things in particular, two domains with, which must be in the reach of majorities, elections and legislative decision-making. So put differently, those with the most votes should win power. There's no theory of liberal democracy that justifies any other outcome. This is not a problem in Israel. This is a problem in the United States where presidents win routinely without winning the most votes. So that's the first point. The second point is those who win elections should govern. Legislative majorities should be able to pass regular laws, provided of course that such laws do not violate civil liberties or undermine the democratic process. Again, I'm not sure about Israel, but in the United States, this is a problem. With the institution of the filibuster, majorities are constantly being thwarted in the parliamentary process or in the legislative process. Filibuster rule is a big problem. Now, my comments have become a little bit too much of a lecture in political theory. And I know the feeling of fear and dread, a feeling like your democracy is in free fall. So I really wanna leave you with a punchline. And that punchline is this. In a highly counter majoritarian system like the United States, where majorities regularly don't govern, calls for more majority rule can in fact be more democratic. But in a highly majoritarian system like Israel, where there already are a few constraints on governments, calls for even more majority rule for those governments are something very different. They are simply a deceptive cover or a fig leaf for anti-democratic power grabs. That's why they should be resisted. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. Many of the examples in your talk, I think, strikingly resonate with what we are witnessing now here in Israel. Um, we'll open. Uh, we'll open to discussion uh, um, after the next uh, presentation. So please. Um, next, we will hear from Adam Shivorsky, the Carol and Milton Professor Emeritus in the Department of Politics of New York University. Adam is a preeminent scholar of democratic societies and institutions. He has written some of the most important works on these topics, including two books. Democracy in the Market and Democracy and Development that are closely related to the national debate we've been having in Israel over the past months regarding the relationship between democratic institutions and economic performance. His recent works included uh, the books Democracy and the Limits of Self-Government, Why Bother with Elections, and perhaps most pertinently, The Crisis of Democracy. We are delighted that you agreed to talk to us uh, today. And so without any further ado, Adam, the floor is yours. Well, as you may expect, my comments are going to overlap greatly with those of Daniel. Uh, but I am going to go lowbrow, low level rather than theoretical and just sort of focus on the mechanics of the process uh, to which I will refer to as democratic backsliding, even though there are many uh, 
if I find it, many, sorry, there are many synonyms of it, as you see, as people refer to backsliding, deconsolidation, erosion, retrogression, or whatever. Uh, I am defining it somewhat just to set the limits of what the cases that I have in mind. One, I want to emphasize, I am not one of those who believes that there is a general crisis of democracy in the world. I think there are lots of countries in which democracy is doing as well or as badly as in the past, but without major changes. So I want to just talk about basically processes, uh, sorry, but uh, I got stuck, uh, uh, that have two dimensions. One is, both mentioned, both by Yotam and by Daniel. One is increasing discretion in making of policies by usurping power, eradicating or undermining the obstacles that may arise from the institutional structure of a particular country. And the second one is increasing partisan advantage. Uh, Daniel, again, gave detailed examples of what Orban did in Hungary, yes, that is making it almost impossible for the opposition to win elections. These two aspects are interrelated, but they are not the same. Now, backsliding, which is the term I'm going to be used, almost always proceeds in steps. Yes. Uh, we don't have moments such as March 31st, 1933, in which Hitler basically assumes dictatorial powers in one legal act. We have steps. And the opposition mobilizes against these steps. What matters in here, I think, is that the, the particular steps and their sequences vary from case to case. As you see, sometimes the first target by the courts, sometimes the media, sometimes the state apparatus, but sometimes also governments take measures which are not steps in the sense that they don't undermine democracy, but they are nevertheless extraordinary devices. So the question that we would want to answer is, what strategy should the opposition adopt given government actions? We don't know. I think the answer to the question is we don't know. And we don't know precisely for the reason that, you know, we have relatively few cases like this. Uh, people define backsliding differently, but maybe we have 20, 30, at most 40. And the sequences by which the government, backsliding governments proceed vary from case to case. So we just don't have enough an opportunity to have well-established empirical knowledge to be able to generate the kind of understanding which I list here, namely, if the government does this and the opposition reacts in the following way, then the government stops, the government fails, or the government succeeds. We just really, I think, don't have sufficiently reliable knowledge, for which I will apologize at the very end again. Steps. I'm going to go into detail here of the mechanics because I think it's perhaps useful to distinguish the steps. And I'm distinguishing them by their legality and their consequences for democracy. It's flagrant, subtle, legal, but pernicious, and legal and despicable, but not necessarily affecting the market. And the reason I'm doing this is that I think that the steps you know, cause and should cause different reactions. One is, uh, I just want to point out to what the opposition should pay particular attention because it's often non obvious as I will show you in a second. And two, I'm gonna to return to the <laughs> Daniel theme, how to talk about 
so flagrancies. Yes. What really matters about the flagrant steps? Um, maybe I should start differently. Yeah. Some steps flagrant. What you're facing in Israel today is flagrant. I have to give you some of this. Since Montesquieu, through recent political science, Weingast, fear, and whatnot, we believe that if the government usurps power, if one of the powers of the government usurps power, there will be a popular reaction against it. This is Montesquieu, there'll be a revolution, a revolution which is going to be designed to establish, re-establish the constitutional status quo, et cetera, et cetera. But people may or may not react. There is very discouraging research, mainly done by Milan Svolik at Yale, uh, which shows that a lot of people are willing to tolerate transgressions of democratic rules and democratic norms in exchange for some kind of policies which they strongly flavor. As a matter of fact, the number that Graham is falling <coughs> identify for the United States is truly discouraging. Only 6% of American respondents in their experiments are unconditional Democrats in the sense that they are not willing to trade democratic norms for any kind of policy gains. Otherwise, just to give you an example, if somebody is strongly for banning abortion, these respondents are willing to tolerate transgression by the Republican party, as long as this party delivers this uh, outcome. So the kind of questions, it, it casts a little bit of light on surveys, namely the kind of questions, uh, you know, do you think that your democracy is the best system in the world, et cetera, et cetera, in which 80% of people always say, yes, 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 yes. They're pretty useless unless they specify exactly what people see as their cost in terms of their preferences. And uh, I believe that when people tolerate it, when people knowingly tolerate violations of democratic norms because they like what the government does, then the government backslides, then the government does undermine. And very often the reasons are not material, but ideological, they are very often racist, religious, nationalist, xenophobic, whatever else. Some examples, I don't want to exceed my time, so I just show it to you. Here are some flagrant examples. Venezuela, you can read for yourself. Turkey. Courts. They can be disabled, they can be dissolved, and they can be packed. And it really matters, I return to it, which it is. Disabling is one thing, dissolving, packing, I think is particularly pernicious. And it's particularly pernicious because then it allows the government to say, but look, what we do is fully constitutional. Uh, one extreme example of is, is Morales in Bolivia. You know, he served his two terms, he faced term limits. He had a referendum on whether he should be allowed to serve the third term. He failed the referendum. He went to the Supreme Court, which he appointed. And the Supreme Court obviously ruled in his favor. A lot of the steps are truly subtle, and this is why I'm listing them, because one really has to pay attention to it. Well, all governments politicize bureaucracy to the extent they can. They appoint people who are loyal to them, but with all kinds of constraints. Here's a, an example of not changing laws, just practices. So in Poland, uh, as you see, the government, the, the parliamentary rules said, that government bills must be open to public hearings, private bills not. What the government does, it offers its bills as private. A nice little example from Poland is 
At one time, the parliament passed the law saying that the constitutional tribunal must consider cases known in which they appear. Since there was a three-year backlog, that obviously, yes, gave the government a three-year window to violate the Constitution. Here's how you get around the Constitution. The Polish Constitution says that uh, there is a constitutional body which is supposed to supervise the media. The government did not abolish this body. It just created a new one and transferred its power to it. And finally, this is a truly minor example, but it shows how much one can, how ingenious some of these people are and what one has to pay attention to it. When the opposition won the mayor election in Budapest, Orban nationalized the revenue from parking tickets. Here is the series which I find particularly um, worth attention and where the rhetorical aspects are become extraordinarily important and kind of cases with which we don't know what to do. And these are the cases in which the government offers a solidly democratic justification for its measures. So they are not anti-democratic in any sense ex ante, but they have really pernicious consequences. So here is, you know, Erdogan extended the vote to Turks living abroad. Why? Because Turks in Berlin overwhelmingly voted for him. Justification? He was extending political rights. The U.S. states, yes, require additional documentation of the, at the polls, obviously, to <laughs> prevent some people from voting, their opponents from voting. Justification, preventing fraud. Uh, Abolishing limits on campaign spending, justification, freedom of expression. Decree rule during COVID, Hungary, Venezuela, required by emergency. NGOs protect from foreign interference. Governments buying media, India, Poland, Hungary. Sorry, not, I shouldn't say governments. Government cronies buying media. What's your justification? You don't even need it. It's just a regular market transaction that Polish government cronies buy a German media firm. It's just a transaction. What it means also is that there are no independent voices. Or sorry, there's only one because it's in part owned by Americans and American ambassador protested, so they couldn't go that far. These are particularly pernicious. I refer to them in some papers I wrote as stealth. Yes, because they are ordinary laws passed according to all the provisions, which all, as Daniel emphasized, the uh, governments should be able to do, but they have pernicious, conse pernicious consequences. Um, the consequences are visible only exposed, and that really creates a problem. One of the most prominent American constitutional lawyers, David Strauss, for example, suggested that courts should anticipate the consequences of particular rulings for democracy in their verdicts, yes? Which sort of strikes you as a little bit odd because presumably courts should consider cases on their own merits, not because of their downstream consequences. So these are particularly difficult class of cases. And uh, I like what uh, Tom Ginsburg and Hoop I have to say, yes, what these kind of measures produce is the situations in which these measures are passed. They all seem democratic. And in the end, we find that their consequences are truly profound and nefarious. So it's worth thinking of two kinds of cases, which may or may not coincide. One is in which the government proceeds backslides because it can, because the public knowingly tolerates violations of democracy in exchange for policy outcomes, and situations in which the government proceeds basically by surprise. Yes, everything seems perfectly democratic, only at one fine moment we find that the executive does whatever it wants, 
and that the opposition finds it extraordinarily difficult to win elections. So we really have two kinds of cases again, yes, backsliding with majority support and backsliding because the government would otherwise lose. Yes. Uh, the, the stealth produces the situation in which people are really turn into unconditional supporters and unconditional opponents of the incumbent. Just, you know, think of the last election in the US, the last election in uh, Brazil, people voted against Trump, not for Biden. 60% uh, of people who voted for Biden say their main motivation was to vote against Trump. And the same with Brazil with Bolsonaro. People voted for Lula, even they hated Lula. Because, why? Because they were against Bolsonaro. So this creates, I don't hate this word, polarization, but that really creates partisan positions built in stone and makes the conflict extremely sharp. And finally, it's worth mentioning that there are all kinds of examples. I don't want to, don't know enough about Israel to give Israeli examples, but all kinds of acts which are perfectly legal, which may not have any immediate or visible consequences for democracy, but nevertheless are extraordinarily divisive and despicable for the opposition. Abortion in Poland is my primary example. So this is kind of a list of cases and they perhaps suggest something also about strategies of the opposition. One, protests against policies. They are normal in democracy, demonstrations, strikes, civil disobedience. We shouldn't be surprised that it happens. It happens in democracy all the time. I think that they are designed to sort of with two goals. One, persuade the government that some acts may be electorally costly for them. Even though they won the election on a particular issue, they are in a minority. And two, they may inflict material costs on the government, uh, particularly strikes and strikes of a particular kind, prolonged strikes in particular sectors may dissuade the government. And we have examples in France. Uh, France is a cemetery of uh, electoral, as our educational reform. Nobody, no government can pass elect educational reforms. People go on the streets, strikes emerge and whatnot. Right now in France, uh, you know, we have this situation with the retirement policies and sometimes opposition is successful even in Poland when the government wanted to tighten the anti-abortion laws even more, it was forced to withdraw. So the success of resistance may depend on what I call the need for cooperation. It may depend on who supports the government, who opposes the government in terms of their economic role. And to end, I'm returning basically to Daniel's uh, point, namely, I'm impressed reading these particular cases of how important are the rhetorical games. Uh, what you see in front of you is uh, a quote from a Putin propagandist who says, yes, so, you know, if we always win elections, what is, what's undemocratic about the fact that we always win elections? It just means we're supported, democracy works. <clears throat> the competition for the mantle of democracy and constitutional is not one in which the opposition always prevails. Yes. Uh, the language of many of the backsliders, and I'm thinking of Madame Le Pen, who says, uh, you know, if I'm elected, I'm going to have referendums and you people will decide. Trump says the same, I'm going to return the government to you. We're not in the interwar period, yes? We're not in the interwar period in the sense that we don't have well-formulated, comprehensive, ideological blueprints for an alternative. We have no communism and no fascism. These games become difficult when people don't perceive and don't understand the consequences for some measures. Protests are can be used by the government as saying the opposition is not democratic, the opposition does not respect 
democratic norms. One nice example in Turkey, there was a demonstration, mass demonstration against a candidate whose uh, wife wore an Islamic scarf and the government easily repressed this demonstration with overwhelming popular support. And to return to the point that we make, I think particularly perverse of the situations which the government attacked the constitutional courts, because then they can use this constitutional imprimatur to justify their actions. So I think the opposition is a difficult situation. It may appear anti-democratic, but if it doesn't act, it may find that it's too late to act. The slide, as uh, Ginsburg and Hook emphasized, may be almost imperceptible. It's obviously easier to act when the violations are more flagrant. And I think the argument for democracy come in so, somewhat two varieties. One is appeals to extrinsic values which democracy we hope implements whether it's equality, whether it's liberty, whether it's justice. But another one, which is very difficult, I think, to convey, are the intertemporal costs. Namely, that even if we like the policies of the government now, if the government gains discretion and entrenches itself in power, then in the future will be unable to replace it or its successors even if we would want to, even if we are convinced that there are better alternatives. This I'm deciding, I just, it comes from today's Le Monde. It's a message by a, um, actually a communist and communist historian, Roger Martelly, who says, yeah, the principal function of the opposition cannot be to be just a mouthpiece for anger. The opposition must have a positive message, not only a negative message. It must propose some comprehensive ideological blueprint of the future, it must show some positive alternative to the government program. This is all flimsy. It's flimsy because it's nothing than speculation. Uh, but I don't want to end on an optimistic, on a pessimistic note. I think we don't know that the backsliders cannot be stopped. That is uh, uh, our ignorance, perhaps, should be a positive motivation for actions rather than negative motivation for actions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. And we'll open the floor for Q&A. So please, everyone, feel free to, to write us your questions. We have about 20 minutes. And Adam, you finished your talk with a point about the opposition. And the first question we have is indeed about opposition strategies. Um, so Uriel Abulouf asked, in Israel, the government might soon reject a Supreme Court's decision to repel its anti-democratic Franken state legislation. What practical lessons can we learn from the experiences of other democracies going through a deep constitutional crisis? What might tilt the trajectory towards the compliance of the government and all security forces? And Daniel, Adam, feel free. Um, to, to reply. Daniel. Okay. Um, <laughs> this, this, is, this is a good question, of course, and the essential question. Um, I mean, I can just point to a couple of things that seem to come up as reoccurring themes in this kind of, when this question has come up in other contexts. Number one, uh, the opposition has to form broad coalitions. So, you know, you don't form coalitions with your allies because they would already be in your camp. You form coalitions sometimes with your competitors. And so the point is to find people who you may deeply ideologically disagree with about fundamental questions. 
and but for whom you can find some kind of common ground over the intrinsic or extrinsic values of democracy. So in the Israeli context, this may mean you know, the left and the religious right form some kind of coalitions, which at first glance seem implausible, but if there's a kind of common anger about the way the government's proceeding, active efforts need to be made to kind of forge these coalitions. And they're uncomfortable, feel like compromise is necessary, and compromise is necessary for both sides. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, I, when, like during the Trump era, you hear kind of never Trump Republicans gathering at, at events where they were like the only Republicans there. And they would sometimes say, you know, this is fine, but I do always have the feeling that as long as I don't say anything that sound, makes me sound like a Republican, then all everybody will accept me as one of them. But so I think really both sides need to find compromises and find common ground. So broad coalitions are necessary. And so, you know, even if the government currently has a majority, how stable is that majority? So that, that's uh, the first thing. A second thing I would say, I'll just stop with the second point is, and this is maybe kind of an argument about civil society at some level. You know, it's it's you know when we say civil society resistance, we sort of imagine people in the streets protesting. That's all very important, but I think in the case of the U.S., one of the things that I think don't doesn't get enough credit is the role that professionals play. And so when I say professionals, I mean people, lawyers, military officers, bureaucrats, scientists who abide by a certain normative code that comes from their professional. So, you know, if you're a member of the American Bar Association, there's certain things your professional status won't allow you to do. Uh, if you're a scientist, similarly, you can, you have abide by a certain professional ethos. And these kinds of professional, e this kind of ethos that comes with your professional status, both is a source of confidence to resist the threat of harassment and is also a source of confidence to resist uh, the threat of corruption, because when power is threatened, of course, it tries to corrupt professionals because professionals are a threat. And so I think the degree to which people can effectively just do their job at a certain level, uh, they can play a heroic role. And so I think that's really critical as well. So I have a footnote, which comes from my native country, Poland, where the government, the peace government, from the beginning, it took the courts as its first target. And it has not been successful in part because of Europe, but in part because of the resistance from the court. Yes. The various courts were quite successful in fighting against the government. So maybe it's, maybe I'm more sympathetic to your second point, Daniel, than to your first one. I'm not sure that it's in the civil society. I think maybe it's in the institution that's under attack itself. And, you know, we know, I mean, you have in mind examples from the U.S., Daniel, yes, where, quote, unquote, it was the deep state which resisted Trump. And, and, and just to add to that, I mean, and, it, and it's driven by a sense of professional autonomy or professional, you know, we, this is not the way things are done. Like that basic kind of sense of motivation, I think, is, is, is critical in order for that kind of thing to play out. Perfect, thanks. And we'll move to a question from Yoav Geffen, who asked, are these processes of democratic backsliding reversible once institutions actually change? Or maybe we would ask how path dependent these changes are. Will scars of the anti-democratic past remain even if the government changes again? So Adam, do you want to begin? Well, I'm trying not to go too abstract on this. Uh, so, yeah, there are two different aspects, yes? One is increased discretion. The next government inherits the relaxed limits, yes? If the backsliding government, in fact, succeeds in increasing discretion over policymaking, that is inherited by the next government. Part is an advantage, on the other hand, is not inherited by the next government. So there, I think the distinction is important. But yes, we have, well, do we have? <laughs> yeah, maybe we do have cases, Brazil I'm uh, thinking of, in which uh, Lula is using some of the increased discretion gained by the Bolsonaro government. But obviously, not part is an advantage. Yeah, I, 
Another interesting example is the reaction to Richard Nixon in the post Watergate era in the United States, where this was somebody who tried to abuse office and did abuse office and uh, was defeated ultimately. But um, the series of reforms followed in the wake. I mean, in 1974, a new class of young, uh, it, it sparked a, a kind of reform movement where a whole series of reforms were passed to try to prevent this from happening again. And so within two, you know, I, I, this is the striking thing where Nixon won overwhelming majorities in 1972 to become president. And then when pollsters were going around in 1974, after he had left office, who voted for Nixon? Like 10% of the public said they voted for Nixon. And so this was, you know, this was a humiliation. And that was partly because, but it, it doesn't just happen automatically. There has to be an active reform movement of people who then come into office to try to undo some of the damage that's been done. You know, I, to what degree were those reforms successful? You know, I don't know. I mean, in some ways, not entirely. But at least I, I think this is the the answer to that question is contingent on how how uh, groups respond in the wake of these kinds of abuses. Perfect. Uh, so the, our next question is from Avishai Green. Uh, a major dilemma the opposition faces is between negotiation in the hope of mitigating the damage and defiance, e.g. quitting parliament in protest of the whole process. What are the considerations in each direction? So basically, how, how do you think the, what do we know from, from history to say about the way that opposition should respond and whether negotiate yes or no? Yes, so Yotam, I think what strikes me immediately is that backsliders are not negotiators. And they are not negotiators because they use an ideology uh, which contains enemies. Yes. Part of the backsliding ideologies is us and them. We have the people, the nation, or not, and others are traitors. So I, I, I don't see much room for negotiations. I don't see a room in which the backsliding governments would be willing to negotiate. They may be willing to co-op some sectors, which they try, but negotiate, I don't think so. There, there's a third option, which is just to sort of try to defeat electorally, mo mobilize people to put pressure on politicians to try to peel away groups from the government to, and, and to win, to win. Um, you know, the, the, the threat of, the problem with negotiation, I mean, negotiation, I, you know, I'm not sure exactly what that means. It depends on what that what negotiate means, but if it means collaborating with somebody who's breaking democratic rules, then that's not such a great option. You know, somebody like Mike Pence, the you know Trump's vice president. I mean, he didn't think he was negotiating with Trump, but I'm sure he often probably told himself, "Well, if I am not in the room, things would have been much worse." And this is what Juan Lin's called the semi-loyalist. In fact, you may be making the situation worse by being there, and that's a kind of rationalizing behavior. And so the danger of negotiation is that it can turn into simply um, uh, enabling. And so that, that's something to be aware of. Thanks. And we'll move to a question from Noam Teitelman, who, who asked, um, how relevant are external pressures to prevent democratic backsliding, both pressures from foreign governments and from foreign civil society, public opinion in other countries or the business community? Daniel? Um, well, I think maybe Adam could talk about this in the case of Poland, because, my, you know, in the case of Poland, I mean, well, I won't say it. I'll let Adam talk about that. I do think it it does matter. Uh, you know, the, you know, the calculus that that uh, autocrats make is that, you know, the cost of repression I mean, this is the classic thing. And one of the costs of repression is how much societal resistance is there. But the other cost of repression for for political, especially political leaders who imagine themselves or try to pretend as if they are Democrats is the international audience costs of, of um, you know, becoming pariahs. And so I think that that can uh, matter. Um, you know, Eastern Europe, certainly there's less leverage over Israel in some ways maybe than Eastern Europe had vis-a-vis -vis the European Union. But I think in, the, in other cases, that's shown to be very important. Well, two comments then, one on Poland. In Poland, the European community was, is crucial and decisive. Poland is losing $180 billion in European funds because uh, 
of its court handling of the courts. Poland is paying a penalty of $1 million a day for the same reason. And the next election in Poland, which is coming soon, is going to be about this 180 billion. The question is going to be, so are we sovereign and independent and everything else uh, and lose the 180 billion? Or do we sell ourselves for 180 billion? So that's a narrow comment on Poland. But my brother comment is, I think Trump was a disaster for democracy around the world. The U.S. just lost its soft power. So I am now very skeptical about public opinion in other countries influencing events in any particular country. Because that promoter of democracy, at least since early 1980s, is just no longer around. Thank you. Uh, next question, uh, Oded. Um, how comparable is the situation in Israel, a country with a democratic DNA, to that in Hungary with much less democratic roots? And that's often also comes up now in the public discussion here. So often the examples of, of Poland and Hungary are used and people are sometimes skeptical. Well, but Israel has a very different tradition and, and democracy has been around for a longer time. How seriously should we take it and what do you think the implications are? I think the use of the analogy of DNA shows the limits of that, because, you know, I'm not sure what it means to have democratic DNA. We don't think it's biological. So clearly the question is intended as an analogy. Um, and so maybe what one means by that is, you know, democracy has been around longer. And that is true. Uh, you know, as Adam's work has shown, rich democracies don't die. Uh, old democracies are much less likely to die. So they do, they do, they do, uh, that does, that does, protect the democracy, but they, it's not something, despite these findings, empirical findings that rich and old democracies don't die, it's not simply the age uh, and uh, the wealth of a democracy that matters. I mean, the presumption is somehow this brings a set of behaviors and norms with it that help prevent, protect the democracy. But if you have a tax on democracy, this shows you that those norms and, and so on are no longer there. And so just being an old democracy is in itself no guarantee of anything, I would say. So here I'm in a real in intellectual crisis. <laughs> I've uh, written all kinds of things saying that democracies survive in countries, wealthier countries, countries with higher per capita income and works like magic. I've written papers which showing that old democracies, old in the very specific sense, democracies that have experienced more partisan alternation in office as a result of elections, that they are much more likely to survive. I do statistical analysis trying to predict the probability that, that a defeated presidential candidate would not recognize defeat that democracy would break in this sense. I do statistical analysis using income and using the number of past alternations in office. And do you know that what is the calculated probability for the United States? It's one in 1.6 million. The probability is something that would happen. So uh, I don't think I should be talking about it because something is obviously wrong. Yeah, I yeah, I don't know. I think it's, I think the fact. I mean, think about it this way: the United States. I mean, I appreciate that bind exactly. What's remarkable is the United States, a country with a long history of turnovers, a very wealthy country, experienced. It, you know, you didn't have a breakdown of democracy under Donald Trump, but it experienced something that no West European democracy experienced, which is a substantial democratic backslide. It went by every metric in in the world. Freedom House, Varieties of Democracy, went from a score of 90 to 83. Now you may say, well, okay, we can live with 83. But the US in 2020 was less democratic than Mongolia, less democratic than Argentina, less democratic than many countries that would shock Americans. And so the question is, is, is that good enough for Israel? 
I mean, do you want, are you, it's say, well, hey, this will protect us. We're not going to have a complete breakdown in an authoritarian, you know, military government, you know, from one day to the next. But if, if people are satisfied, I think the fact that the U.S. could experience suggests that Israel could experience this. And if that, you know, if that's acceptable, fine. But I think these laws of social science, which I genuinely believe, I think wealth and age helped protect American democracy, did protect it entirely. And so that's a serious, you know, consideration. Okay, so we'll ask the final Ash a question, which is how can the opposition avoid depicting the other side as the enemies when any concessions on its part may legitimize the backsliders or the steps they take? If I may understand, I really think that it matters that the opposition has some kind of a positive vision of the future. The op yeah, there's a fascinating Chilean film, I think the title is No, about the debates in the anti-dictatorship forces in Chile in, 18, uh, in 1989 on the eve of the referendum, where the opposition was naturally campaigning against the dictatorship and highlighting the barbarian crimes that the dictatorship committed. But it was all negative, 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 negative. And at one time, somebody within the, the staff of the opposition said, no, no, this is not working. And the polls were showing that it wasn't working. We have to somehow offer people a positive vision of the future. And do you know what was the campaign slogan of the opposition? It was alegria, happiness. Hmm. I just think that that's essential. There cannot be just, as this French communist whom I cited said, you know, the, the left cannot be just a mouthpiece of anger. I, I agree with that. I mean, one thing I would add, I think that worked very effectively. I mean, this is more a question of messaging and so on, but worked very effectively, I think, in the 2022 uh, congressional elections in the United States and the 2020 presidential elections was a very uh, intentional strategy uh, by Democratic activists to create a new category, which is the MAGA movement or the MAGA Republicans. They're not even calling them Republicans, the MAGA movement the ultra magas and so on. And you've heard even Joe Biden use this. And the purpose of that is to appeal, because if you say that the Republicans are authoritarians, how are you ever going to get a Republican to vote for you? And it's, it, it's repolarizing. If you can kind of identify where the real threat comes from as a faction within the group that is causing all the damage and highlight what that, name that faction and make that faction the threat then it kind of is a way of diffusing the polarization. And I think that, I think that proved to be pretty effective in the United States. Perfect. So I should apologize that we won't be able to address all the many questions, but we are uh, running off, out of time. So let me just thank so much Adam and Daniel for the great presentation and the lively discussion. I just know that one insight I'm taking with me from this discussion is that the process of democratic uh, backsliding or democratic erosion is not deterministic that is not preordained by demography or by a specific set of institutions, a set of government. And instead the democratic backsliding is contingent on the actions of the government, but also of the opposition. And maybe something to keep in mind is that we, the public are not just the audience in this show and that we actively participate in an ongoing struggle over the functioning of our democratic institutions. And this is something that I will certainly keep in mind in the coming weeks and months. So I will just again thank Adam and Daniel for taking the time to join us today, both your time and I on behalf of the political science department at the Hebrew University and Tel Aviv University. Very much appreciate this. And thank also for the audience who joined us wherever you are. And this is all for today. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Thank you.